So I'm going to tell you the kind of the story of, of how I came by. I think I have a longer title than this uh, that I gave you, but I, I don't know, remember what it was. But, but I came by this uh, notion that I could actually start thinking about humans, a very curious species. And uh, I present to you this because they're all I think there are all kinds of options here for modeling or thinking about uh, things. So I'm just hoping to get some cool ideas if anybody has any. Um, so this uh, is one of a couple of things I do. I also work on canopy biology. So I just had this come out, comparative canopy biology and the structure of ecosystems, com encouraging uh, uh, canopy biologists, that is tree canopy biologists, to look at things like biofilms and coral reefs and mowed lawns. There's a Basto Wilson in, in uh, uh, New Zealand has studied mowed lawns an inch deep, and they have uh, five layers in them, which for some reason is the same number of layers that is purported to be in a rainforest and a kelp forest. So no one's particularly uh, come up with a reason for that, other than maybe people are, it's a fiction. Uh, but in any case, and I could just uh, show you a picture. So if you begin to look uh, tired eyes and halfway through this, I'm going to shift over to show you pictures. So we'll just see what happens. But what uh, transpired for me is I was working on an invasive species called the Argentine ant, and I started to think about things about some uh, society issues because I found that uh, people were talking about societies in a way that didn't quite make sense to me. So I've kind of pursued that. And we'll uh, begin with the social brain hypothesis, which has already come up today, Sergey. But uh, this is uh, uh, an idea that's been influential in uh, anthropology, and uh, basically uh, Robin Dunbar has done a good job of promoting this idea, the idea that our, our brain size can relate to the number of friends we can have. So he comes up with about 150 close or mentally costly relationships. Uh, but in his original paper, he said something that I thought was interesting, and that is, how is it that despite the apparent, uh, apparent cognitive constraints on group size, Modern human societies are nonetheless able to form super large groups, e.g. nation states. And uh, basically, I'll pursue that idea, and, and my view is that it's a confusion about what a society is. Uh, because most anthropologists have been focused on kin and cooperation sorts of issues and looking at societies. And to me, that's not the same as the nature of the societies themselves. Uh, so I've spelled out a lot of things here just to, to follow, for you to follow along. But uh, if you look at, like, Ed Wilson's sociobiology, he defines a society as a group of individuals organized in a cooperative manner. So cooperation is key. Now, you'll find out in the sociology literature, it's not. And this idea was dropped quite a long time ago, but it has been for uh, biologists. So I, you know, I've, I think cooperation has a great value. We have to study it. But as I point out here, there are all kinds of relationships in the society. Your worst enemy is your, in, can be in your society. They can share your passports and so forth. So I think once you realize that, there's a need to frame it in a different way. And the change, the emphasis from cooperation to the group. What is a group? And to me, a society is a group that's organized with a certain kind of uh, structure. It has a membership. And those memberships can include individuals you like and don't like. It can include conflicts like, you know, Venezuela with all this murder going on. It includes functioning societies, all kinds of things. But there's still clarity about who belongs and who doesn't. And this is the issue of social identity. So this has taken me into talking to psychologists. So I've actually given talks at Yale and been parts of uh, uh, groups looking at issues of uh, social identity in humans. They love to hear about ants. It breaks up the day. <laughs> so yeah, outsiders are ordinarily rejected. There have to be ways for outsiders to come in. They're, they're often very arduous ways, so a female a uh, chimpanzee will transfer to another group, and be rejected sometimes, and killed other times. You better be in heat. 
if you're going to make the move. Uh, so, in short, to be social is not, having a is not equal to having a society. I'm saying about uh, the same thing in five different ways just to get it in there, because we're not, I think, used to thinking that way. So, what I would argue is that most people look at societies in terms of networks. They look at them this way. And uh, those networks occur within the society, but they're never the whole society. It would be very hard to define societies. You would never want to map out societies uh, like China based on membership. It's just impractical. Uh, and there, is the, there are those hermits out here and others that don't relate to others. And some of them are very creative people who do a lot of good things. They're the, the hermit writers and so forth. So we're not even talking people that are outcasts. They can still be part of the society. So um, this uh, leads to an interesting question that I don't see asked anywhere. Everyone looking at primates, they're always talking about networks and who's relating most to two, but no one ever talks about uh, what the connections are with the least connected individuals in a society. How much do they know ab about each other? What's happening at the other end? And I would argue that something is happening at the other end. Okay, so societies cannot be defined in terms of cooperation. They're about identity distinct groups. So I've been around the world, actually. This is my excuse recently to do things. I am an expert at excuses to do things, meeting with different researchers from uh, Randy Wells to Dolphins and Susan Alberts and uh, all kinds of folks working on different groups. And uh, so one question comes up from this thinking. What if the, how little cooperation can there be uh, Venezuela, there doesn't seem to be much right now. Uh, and uh, Richard Wrangham uh, said instantly, well, as long as there's a group and they uh, share, share each other as mates and drive others off, it could be a society. And in fact, uh, there's uh, Dan uh, Bloomstein, I believe at UCLA, working at Marmots, who gave a talk recently, and he said, these Marmots, they don't even seem to like each other. <laughs> but they still formed a group that was functional in terms of uh, mates and so forth. So most of the research on issues of identity in, in, is, is in, by biologists is about kin specifically. But the uh, important thing to remember, and I've been going through the literature in detail, in many different kinds of societies, there are almost always groups, substantial portions of societies that are not related and that outsiders can be let in and become full members of the society, treated just as if they were kin in many cases. So I would argue that, in fact, societies have to be able, whether you're an elephant or a human, to be able to recognize alliances separately from kinship, separately from membership. So once I started thinking about that, I noticed something that really hadn't been pointed out. It was surprising it wasn't in sociobiology, Ed Wilson's book, or elsewhere, and that is that societies of vertebrates uh, essentially always have 200 members or less. 200 is the limit I've seen. There's a chimpanzee community uh, that has 200 members about now. Everything bigger than that is an association where individuals can come and go. To actually have closed groups with a the membership, they tend to be always small. And I call those societies individual recognition societies. Those are societies in which every individual knows every other individual in the group. Now, this hasn't been proved. You can see a lot of statements in the literature that suggest it's true. Uh, but the idea there is those two least uh, associated monkeys in the troop still know each other and recognize each other. And there are individual dyads of chimpanzees in Gumbay that have never been seen together, but we can assume that at some point they have been together. They're females that are reclusive in their little private patches. Now, there are also, uh, there's also a different kind of society, and I call that an anonymous society. And that's where you use markers or labels or, or, uh, or symbols, if you want to get fancy, uh, distingu distingu to distinguish insiders from outsiders. 
And those are the social insects and a couple other examples. So you'll see exa uh, cases where you have much bigger groups than 200, thousands in the case of galatas, and uh, these herds. But it's interesting, if you poke around in the literature, you'll see things like uh, Thor Bergman uh, mentioning at one point that the galata band, which is a few individuals within these thousands, or sorry, the band is the thousands, they're, they're different names for these things, but uh, may not be a true social entity, but rather a simple aggregation of animals based on predator protection. And within those bands, you have small clusters of individuals that know each other really well, and they don't seem to know anybody else. This is a really amazing thing about galatas. They simply have no brain space for anybody else. So in anonymous societies, uh, looking at insects particularly, you have this kind of national flag, I'd call it a scent, and it indicates whether you belong or not. There's an instantaneous response when you don't have the right one. And uh, the interesting thing is that the social brain hypothesis breaks down completely here. Ants can have societies of millions of individuals, and it turns out uh, that their brains get smaller the bigger the societies get. And there's some evidence that the human brain has declined in size over the, since agriculture. And the idea for ants is that in a bigger society, you don't have to do all the work. You can be focused on one thing. Maybe you don't have, need as many brain cells. And, it, and similarly, humans in large modern societies don't have to figure out how to make fires or build tents. We focus on one thing and buy our iPod or whatever. And uh, sorry, that's dating me. Uh, but in any case, the brains actually get smaller as societies get bigger. So let's look at a couple of ants just for fun, because that's the way it is. And there are actually some of my photographs. So uh, if you want any photography advice, just uh, squint and press the button a lot. Uh, one of the really cool ants with large societies are the leafcutter ants. These societies can be up, uh, colonies can be up to several million. Here's a picture from a helicopter in Paraguay. And these nests are probably the size of this room and going down even deeper than this room is because they can go down 30 feet to the water table, contain tens of thousands of chambers. And uh, they have these highways that can be 10 inches wide going for hundreds of meters. And they actually fight between these at some territorial boundary. The really cool thing is, uh, Ron, there's a guy, Howard, who studied these, and he, saw, he found out that if he, the ants have the scent, they all respond nicely to each other, but if you carry an ant across this nest to the other side, you sometimes get this moment jolt, as if they don't know who you are. So it may be that these nest populations are actually divided up in different ways, and they're not actually experiencing each other, and they're diverging in their identity, these uh, hydrocarbon cues on the uh, outside of the ant. Uh, but the same thing applies to small ant societies. This, this is an ant with a very small society, a dozen individuals. I spent a week getting this colony, cracking open tig, twigs on the rainforest floor in Costa Rica. You get a queen and a few ants there. They also rely on a, a scent to keep track of each other. And it turns out that ants don't recognize each other as individuals. The scent is all they know. So they know, can know a cast, they'll know the queen, which individual the queen is, but they don't know individuals. They don't waste brain space on that stuff. It's, do you know how much brain space humans waste on that stuff, keeping track of individuals? But the coolest ants are also the most horrific, and I'm, I should hate them because they're invasive species, uh, but the ones with the super colonies. And this is what got piqued my interest in the whole question about societies that I'm driving at here is this one, which is the Argentine ant, which is native down in Argentina and has now taken over uh, most of Southern California. In fact, the entire region of Southern California contains four colonies. And you can, the largest one is so big that you can take an ant from San Francisco, and if you've ever been to San Francisco and seen an ant in a kitchen, or even in a yard, it's the Argentine ant, because there are millions of them in the average yard. 
They're a blanket. They wipe out all the other ants that come anywhere near them. Take an ant from there, drive it all 500 miles uh, down to Mexico and drop it off, and it's still fine. It's as if it's home. But if you take it to this neighborhood, uh, and this is David Hallway who's studying them, this fine upper middle class neighborhood outside of San Diego, and drop it one inch over this borderline, it's dead within the minute. And in this yard, this fine upstanding citizens have the largest wars ever waged on this planet because there are lines and dead ants going for miles. So this is this art of war thing that I talked about, but uh, uh, this is the, the mass of ants along the border front. And they go right up to that point, and they meet the enemy, and they know them immediately. And the ants are just pouring into this front. Ants don't give up, as you probably know. Um, so what other species does this remind you of? Uh, there's another species of, there is at least one species of vertebrate ha that has societies of more than 200. And of course, it's us. And uh, to me, this suggests uh, the possibility of, of uh, the same kind of confusion you see with the ants. Because for the ants, the biologists uh, who are studying these ants will stand in a field in Southern California and look out in the horizons and say, how can there be so many colonies here? And then you'll say, well, wait a second, didn't these ants arrive in a shipment, perhaps it was 110 years ago by train, and they spread out from that point, and it was always co one colony all every step of the way? And they will agree with that, but they still slip back into, how can there be so many colonies here? And you can think of that as the same question for humans. If uh, aliens arrived in this planet 10,000 years ago and saw hunter-gatherer groups and came back and saw modern China. So the challenge to me is to see if there are, there's ways of explaining this that are simple and straightforward and don't require much change in, in evolution. Because both of these changes happen pretty fast. The Argentine ants came up and spread in California very fast. So this was this paper. So um, there's a couple, there was a, at least one instance, I won't mention a name, where one of the biologists studying the Argentine ant was uh, interviewed on a radio show. And the, the guy, is, the radio interviewer is getting a little confused and saying, well, uh, are these one society or not? And th this person says, well, they act like they're one society. And I'm going like, what other criteria is there? I mean, it's their choice. You figure out what they're doing. The, uh, the usual thing nowadays is to leap in and do genetics and prove that this and that is going on. But if they're choosing to see themselves as part of the same society, no matter how diverse they are, you treat them that way. And if they're fighting on the borderlands, it's a sure indi indication of that. So. So this, this paper came out a couple years ago, hence those reprint things there. And I, I started to think about these issues for humans. And uh, here are a few thoughts, and maybe there's some things that could be modeled or worked on. And one of the things I say in the paper is that humans, humans evolved to be walking billboards for displaying our identities. And there's a lot of discussions of bare skin and what you do with bare skin, and certainly you can market and so forth, but people were mostly missing the other half of this, is just you have hair styling. And it's a human universal to style hair. The first thing you do if you're an Iroquois Indian and take a slave, and it's true for slavery around the world, is you get rid of their hair, it removes their identity. So I was actually in Africa and showed a picture of another tribal group to a person uh, that was in front of me, and the first thing they pointed out was the hair. There was something wrong. So, how, does, how should markers work? Well, one thing, of course, is they should be hard to replicate. And uh, it's not always a complete success story for the ants. So this is Cosmophasis bitiana, which is studied by Mark Elgar, a fabulous little jumping spider. Uh, who turns into an ant. It's fabulous. It's really a cool story. Because uh, it loves to eat ant larvae. This is a weaver ant nest up in a tree. And it's normally 
beaten away and so forth, but it eventually grabs a couple of ant larvae, manages to munch on them, and get ant juice all over its body. And uh, at that happens, it seems to get the right combination of scents going, and the ants let it go into the nest. And it marches around and eats larvae. The soldiers aren't quite as impressed. They'll try to drive it off. But the really cool thing is, is if that spider leaves the nest and hops over, jumping spider, hops over to another nest of a different colony, it's attacked as if it's a foreign ant, not as if it's a spider. So the really interesting thing about humans is that there's, of course, a lot of psychology literature on this, and that it's automatic and mandatory. We assess each other faster than you brink an eye. When you're walking by someone, you're recognizing who they are, where they come from, and all kinds of things around them, and making opinions about them before they en the opinions enter your consciousness. And this happens very young. It happens at three months for races. That's uh, three months is before the kid has language, before you've told them what a race is. They already know races. Uh, Catherine Kinsler and so forth. And uh, this is really something because there's all this, there's this vast literature on kinship, the importance of kinship. And I'm sure kin are important, but I think it's mostly at the level of the nuclear family and probably not much else. And here's, here's one thing I'd like to see someone do. For all this literature on kinship, no one's asked how good are we at recognizing kin? Because I'm an idiot. Uh, uh, you know, if you tell me someone's sister's mother-in-law's uncle is such, such and such, I do not know how to work that out in my head. And I think most people don't how, know how to work that out in their head. I, don't, I, think, I think these are things that are arduously taught later on when you're 8 or 10 years old, not at 3 months when you already know races and ethnicities. So, just a thought. Okay, most of the literature on this whole issue of markers, symbols, uh, concerns language. And for good reason. There's a lot of information on language, and it's probably the most important uh, marker out there for modern humans. But I would argue that these markers are cumulative. They are all over us. I mentioned hair, but they are literally all over us. They are very subtle things. An average... Um, uh, an American rec can recognize the difference between a Japanese and American and a Japanese Japanese person from a photograph. The subtleties about how they smile, all kinds of things are happening. So yes, and I, I think a lot of these things would have arisen before language, and we'll get to that. Okay, so a couple of obvious e examples, but my favorite is skipping to Inglorious Bastards. Anybody see that movie? Oh uh, yes, I would like. Wait, three beers. Do not get it wrong. And uh, these labels are all over the place, but the really cool thing, as far as I'm concerned, is they don't actually have to be connected with a person. You can just have this raw label there, and we have an emotional response to it, and it's really amazing. Uh, I spoke to Antonio Damasio about this. No one studied this kind of response to pure symbols. The fact someone that's undergone, gone through the Holocaust can panic over the, seeing, you know, the wrong symbol. Our responses to these kinds of things are certainly very important to assessing how we deal with each other. So, okay, really cool thing. We saw that ants can do these things very cheaply. They don't need big brains. There's lots of talk about societies needing big brains. Uh, but we can pick out symbols with very little cost and... Uh, without any kind of obligation. And uh, so what I would argue that means is that we can be within a society and focus on the relationships that do matter. Maybe, therefore, Dunbar's number of 150 people come up in this case. These are, this is the advantage of the big brain. This is where it comes in more than these labels, potentially. And this leads me to this awesome picture here, the most awesome thing ever conceived of. This scenario where you walk into a Starbucks and you don't want to kill everybody. 
Because you know what, what a chimpanzee would do if it walked into a Starbucks full of chimpanzees it had never met. Remember, I called them individual recognition societies. If it, doesn't, if it sees chimpanzees it doesn't like or has never met, if there are any unrecognized faces, it will go into a tantrum. You're in, this is wild chimpanzees, will just go crazy. Um, so this is a difference between uh, ants, of course, uh, and humans is uh, they team up for, to get work done, but they don't develop alliances. They have small brains, they don't pick each other out individually, they don't know each other individually, they are totally nas nationalists. Small brains. Okay. So the weird question becomes, one of them is, at least, why don't more vertebrates have anonymous societies? They don't cost in much of anything, if that's true. Why don't they do it? Uh, and it may be that they are investing their effort in these kind of individual relationships. Uh, and that makes this whole business uh, prohibitive for them. And it may be that they've never evolved that because there's no use of being a group of lions. A thou Imagine going to Africa and you were in the Serengeti and a group of a thousand lions started rushing at you. This would be very cool and very ant-like, but there's no way they're going to feed themselves. Okay, breaking the rules. Uh, you may not, you know all about the naked mole rat. Another thing that's cool about the naked mole rat, other than it has queens and everything else, is that it has a colony scent. And uh, they actually can have colonies up to 400. So I lied slightly about other vertebrates. And then there's this wasp that's made a number of headlines in the last few years uh, that has individual face recognition. They can have larger groups of wasps. But as the season progresses, the wasp colonies get into the thousands and all kinds of falls apart. Presumably, there's only so much a wasp can keep in its brain. I don't know. So going in a little towards the human direction now, uh, chimpanzees were interesting because it was a big deal uh, in the early days of Jane Goodall how wonderful they were. Sure, they had arguments in here and there, but basically the view was that their connections went off into the distance sort of uh, indeterminately. You could have friendships anywhere. You could fight over status, sure, but still, uh, there was no boundaries, and therefore nothing I would call societies, no memberships. And then she, Jane saw them killing each other. And she realized that these two groups had formed with separate territories that had been one group before, one community, and something triggered it. And uh, going back through the data, there are now a couple of people, uh, uh, and Pusse and others are working on this, showing that these groups started to show up, uh, the differences between the groups started to show up a while before, but I'll get back to that later. So, knowing who's in your group is a life and death matter, but it had been missed. It's very easy to miss. Unless you get to the border of China, you don't know that China is a society in the sense I'm talking about. Uh, the difference is, of course, uh, none of these apes use symbols to identify their groups. We'll get back to that a little bit later. So, how did this shift go about? Uh, you started off with individual recognition societies. Everybody had to know each other, as it seems to be true of chimpanzees and bonobos, and then you gain these labels and you're able to uh, form larger and larger groups. Be comfortable with each other in the room like we are here without knowing each other. When did that happen uh, and how? Well, there's a route through social learning, like a lot of things, and uh, you know, you know all the stories of social learning, the handshake is my favorite. Some chimps hold hands while they're grooming each other like this, which seems very impractical. And others do it down here or don't hold it all. Um, or, or you know, this kind of thing. Uh, but the th difference, of course, from humans is uh, if a female transfers to another community and it holds the hand the wrong way, no one tries to kill it. No one seems to even notice. These things aren't actually used uh, as as knowledge of identity at all. But there is something really cool called the pant hoot that gets closest to this uh, form of copying. And chimpanzees of a particular community will have a particular pant hoot, and they seem to copy each other over time and converge on the same pant hoot. 
Now, the neighboring chimpanzee community will tend to have a, will have a different pantoot, and it's of, often maximally different because they're neighbors versus ones farther away. So they have this uh, pantoot uh, patchwork going off into the distance. But this seems to be used as what I would call a uh, group coordination symbol. There's no evidence that they actually walk up to each other and give the pantoot so that they know who they are before they're recognized. What they do is they actually call to each other from a distance and keep track of different groups in different places. And ants will have this kind of what I call group coordination symbol as well, uh, where uh, they will lay down a pheromone specific to their colony, and therefore when they come across a bit of terrain owned by someone else, they immediately recognize it. It uh, sort of covers the terrain in general and where they, and, uh, the groups are. But... Uh, well, I think this was supposed to be a video and I forgot about it, but never mind. Everybody knows what the panhoot sounds like because it's what Jane Goodall did, does on TV all the time. That's the panhoot. Fabulous thing. Try it at home. The, uh, now, the thought that it's a group coordination symbol and not used for recognition, is there's one case that's really cool. There's a guy named Andrew Marshall at the University of Michigan who... Uh, 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 they, had, they transferred an individual from outside into a zoo group. And the individual from outside was eventually accepted, but it couldn't pronounce the local pantoot. And they eventually killed it. So maybe they're on the way. Okay, this, this initial step I'd call a password, basically. And uh, this is uh, the... the great term that shows up all over psychology, reducing the cognitive load of social surveillance. We simply don't have to check each other They're out all the time. A, a, a primate in a troop is looking around all the time to seeing what's happened. It's not sitting there reading its uh, phone slash computer at the, uh, the shop. It's actually having to be constantly on guard. And these, you know, these troops are very high stress things because they are constantly on top of each other. Okay, so the trouble, of course, with this hypothesis is that it's impossible to track down these kinds of early cues that might have been used. They would not have started off by uh, painting a, an American flag on the side of a rock. But there are uh, some, some signs that at least early human groups were above 200. And some put it at 400 to 1,000. And that's both Dunbar's brain's calculations, putting the group up beyond 200, and the move in, movement of stone material over space. So that might be an indication that it goes back quite far in time. And this is a rectus. You know, it could go back a couple million years if that was true. But goodness knows how we'd ever prove it. So I'm going to go into a couple things about hunter-gatherers, which I think are really interesting because uh, uh, they've changed so much over the years and people's perception of them has changed as well. Uh, and one of the perceptions that you'll see out there quite often is the idea of hunter-gatherers don't really have uh, societies. They have this kind of thing that Jane Goodall thought ha the chimpanzees had where everyone kind of graded off into the distance in this language and so forth. And uh, so they have Hunter gatherers, of course, uh, the ones that were nomadic had bands of 30 to 50 people. And many people actually associate a band with the society. And certainly it's an economic unit, it functions together, and it's a social unit, and that if there are too many individuals, they argue too much and they go elsewhere, and if there are too few, they can't get things done, and they join another group. So that kind of dynamic is happening on, happening, but they're actually, to have that dynamic, they have to be connected with other bands. And uh, there are reasons to think that they would be, because, uh, uh, as I say here, these are all kinds of things we expect of humans in that all other sorts of human societies do have these closed communities. And chimpanzees, which are fission fusion as these hunter-gatherers were, have closed communities. And uh, the information in the early literature, uh, up through Irv Devore and so forth, was that there were ethno-linguistic groups best studied in Australia that tended to be between 200, maybe up to 2,000 individuals with bands throughout that 
area spread out, having the same culture and the same language. And these are the kinds of uh, things you, you see talked about. A sense of superiority, talking about the others, often calling them animals and you human. This is pretty amazingly consistent. Uh, and, and having names for themselves. This is where names become particularly important. important. So one of my assumptions about labels that's interesting and certainly a, a big issue in itself is that in a hunter-gatherer band, you have your family and you have your society, but you didn't have much of anything else. They did not have book clubs in hunter-gatherer societies. They both couldn't afford them and they couldn't read. And so what we have now is just an immense number of groups we've formed and this capacity to form groups all over the place is certainly a, a, a big part of the psychology literature and a completely different thing than you see in other animals. Uh, I think there are values to this capacity to form groups. If you're going to go hunting out, out hunting for the day uh, with three or four compa companions and you were like thinking about the other group that went out from the same band and you're going to beat them and so forth, there might be values to forming little groups all the time. Now, one of the things that really intrigued me when pursuing this was that there's no discipline to studying the life and death of societies. Once you have a society that's a closed group, it has to die sometime or at least transform and change and divide. But no one had really picked this out. In ants, there was uh, a fair amount of work because the queen flies out, starts her new nest to most species. That's very cool, but nowhere in sociobiology, a large book, does that ever mention the life and death of societies as kind of an issue, and it seems like it should be its own field. So I'm going to go into that because I think there's some opportunities for thinking about and modeling ideas. And I think this is really a, a big mystery because there's very little information. And the reason there's very little, little information is it's a rare event. Forming a society is a rare event. There's now uh, genetic data suggesting that chimpanzee societies, uh, communities last for centuries. Uh, so you don't see it all the time. Uh, Jane Goodall set it off by feeding them too many bananas and they, they broke apart into two societies. And uh, here's the general pattern that you get from different animals, but uh, particularly chimpanzees and bonobos since our, they're our relatives. There's a, an, an ex a greater social stress, either because bananas or more likely because of society growth and bananas combined. And at some point, since chimpanzee societies normally get up to 150, so maybe 80 or 100, uh, this stress builds and you get the emergence of subgroups. And these subgroups can last for years. Uh, John Matani's group in Uganda He's had one community with two subgroups that have been there for many years. They've now reached 200. He's expecting them to break apart. And at some point or another, they divide, divide, and it seems to be really fast. And no one has seen it happen. There's been a division recorded for chimpanzee, chimpanzees under Jane Goodall and bonobos in the Congo with some Japanese researchers. Otherwise, there's no information. But there have been work on a number of other primates. So the pattern seems to be there. Uh, we had a picture over there that, uh, so I would say this, yeah, we, what do you, what do you gain from labels? The labels provide a certain strength to a group that can override these kinds of stresses. I would argue one reason societies might be able to grow larger despite stresses. And then when you do look at the literature, it's really interesting because it seems like they're the same stages particularly as studied in New Guinea, you get subgroup formation and then suddenly division. So I'll just map out what this might look like because I think it would be really interesting to consider this in some kind of formal way. So one thing about uh, markers is that they can shift and the group boundaries can remain stable. People can take in differences and changes as long as they uh, accommodate those this is Frederick Barth, a classic paper on ethnic group and boundaries. Uh, but groups tend to be more stable 
uh, uh, less stable than we think they are. Across the board for humans, people assume their own groups are like them when there's more diversity there. So here's a hunter-gatherer group. This is a, a band. This is a band. And we have a different society down here with a different kind of, uh, sorry, a, 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 this is a bow and uh, uh, an arrow made by a band of people. Let me explain that a little better. A band of people making different kinds of arrows. The people down here are a different society, make a completely different kind of arrow. <laughs> Let's change that to words since it's easier to talk about. So across the bands of an uh, ethno-linguistic group, a group of hunter-gatherers uh, with distinct boundaries, you can have variations from place to place because they're widely separated. They don't really know what's going on. They assume the guys at the other end of the territory are behaving like them. But variations emerge. And then you have the other society down here with the they animal name for them. And uh, notice it's what they think that matters. It's like the ant thing. Uh, if they decide the language differences don't matter, it doesn't matter what the linguist thinks. And there's a lot of confusion in the literature about this. So over time, divergences may become great enough, you know, over uh, quite a bit of time, that you get social stress building up. And eventually, you'll get a subgroup. And uh, at that point in humans, they tend to give themselves a separate name. And the one that changes the least, the conservative group, you know, the conservatives, <laughs> say that we're the real Gumpha Papa people. And the ones up there saying, no, we're the Oompha Loompha people, or whatever, I don't know. And uh, so variations happen, but they still interact and uh, you know, mate within this group freely and so forth. And then uh, suddenly, there's a break, and the picture disappears. But you can imagine the break, and you have two societies. And no one really knows what happens that year, because it seems to be very fast. But someone, they, you know, some event happened for Jane Goodall's chimpanzees at a moment, and they s totally split apart. And apparently for humans, the same kind of divergence can happen. And after that point, it seems that there's a lot more change. It's as if they ch pointedly change to be different from each other. Now that they're separate, they really emphasize the differences that's known for languages. And uh, all these things could be studied in, s in terms of uh, that a psychologist would understand. So the, these are uh, two subgroups. Uh, separating over time, I'm not going to go into all the terms, but there's, you see your, your own group more like yourself than they really are, you see the out group more like them than they really are, so everybody looks similar, you see the difference is bigger than it really is, and so forth, until you have this schism. And Fabio Sani is one of the few people working on this uh, at the University of Dundee, not for hunter-gatherers, but for modern societies and different kinds of schisms. So, one final thing. I guess I have five minutes left or something, is uh, uh, what happened with agriculture? What happened with agriculture? It's usually discussed this way. We got agriculture, and societies could get really big. But this is skipping a couple of things, I would argue, if you look at it this. It can't be just a matter of more food. And here's the case in point I would give. These guys. These guys aren't agriculturalists, but they're like you. They go to the shopping center and get all the food they want, usually by biting someone in their case, because they don't have dinero. Uh, but uh, you can go, this is at the edge of a city, but you can go to New Delhi or wherever, and you'll find an immense density of these primates. And it turns out that their groups, their troops, are essentially no bigger than the troops out in the distance uh, with the little food to go around. They're just packed together. So the question becomes, why did the Nile Valley uh, create an empire? Why couldn't there have just been hundreds and thousands of small hunter-gatherer groups packed into little villages? So my argument about that is part of the story has to do with interaction rates. If you're in a hunter-gatherer group spread out, by fission fusion, with a few here and a few there, you don't really know at all what's happening at the other end of your uh, territorial range. They could be doing something completely different. You get very poor feedback. But as people packed into smaller communities, and tighter communities, I should say, uh, 
There is in constant information going back and forth about labels, how to behave, and if changes in behavior happened, whether you accepted them or not, get, got worked out and so forth. And so you could get a bigger community acting in concert in terms of these markers. Now, of course, this is part of an interplay with other things, and these markers were determined, in fact, uh, a lot of what the rules that leaders uh, create has to do with markers, how to dress, how to behave, what's proper and what's not. And you have the religion doing the same thing, and writing and roads carrying this information farther and farther afield. So I think there's ways of looking at this in terms of being comfortable in the room over bigger and bigger spaces, uh, not in terms of controls from above or below, but in terms of pure uh, stability of people's behavior. Okay, various and sundries, but uh, thanks very much. <laughs> Suddenly occurred to me I didn't know what, quite where to end, but that's... Have some time for some questions? To the microphone. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm a social psychologist here, so I, I love your talk. This was great. Um, <laughs> um, I had like, one question about how these markers um, travel, right? They're quite important for recognition. Um, so um, it, it sounds like, I, mean, I don't know what ants do, whether it all needs to be across uh, a network of dyadic interactions for the same pheromones to travel. But, but for humans, that, that doesn't have to be the case, right? We can update our mar societal markers by, uh, through certain technologies, like watching TV and reading newspapers and so on, right. national media. So uh, to me, it seems like technology I is a huge factor here in, in terms of uh, change and emergence of societal markers, for right. humans at least. Well, I stopped with roadways there, but clearly that goes right on to electronics with the... But yeah, and, uh, but the, the interesting thing is when you look at the dynamics, of, I'm, I'm now writing about uh, modern societies and patterns that emerge there, and if you look at, uh, uh, I have a friend who's a writer who went over to China, she's Chinese, and she said, you know, I was worried, because she's Chinese-American, that I'd arrive there and they just want to take me in and I couldn't go home. And she arrived there and she was totally foreign. They didn't like, mm, foreign person. And the truth is, it seems to be, and what you look through the literature, but I'd like to see more on this, is that no, much, uh, no matter how many things are impinging from the outside, people maintain their identity. And there's a lot about this in Frederick Barth and others, that you can have people will hold on to their identity. And in fact, the more two societies need each other, the more their identities diverge, because they want to maintain their individuality, too. Uh, there's uh, some, you know, really interesting stuff by Marion Brewer on, you know, this optimal uh, level of distinctiveness. It's really cool. People want to be like other people, but they want to be different at the same time. If you're too alike, if you're in a bunch of clones, you get really depressed. And if you're too different, nobody talks to you. So this balance seems to be reflected in people's responses to outside influences. So those will keep markers from... You, markers can come in, but not reflect on how people think about their identity, which isn't exactly your your point, but it, it just came to my mind as an interesting question. Yeah. Hey Mark, uh, as I was listening to you, I was thinking that uh, one of your, you asked for how, see, how things form, how society split and, or group split. Yeah. And it seems to me that uh, looking at uh, religion might be a really good uh, example to see some of these processes in action. I mean, take uh, Christianity uh, uh, through enforcement of codes and everything. Uh, Catholicism tried to keep out the heretics, sometimes cruel ways, until you had to split between the Eastern and Western Church, and then uh, eventually uh, the, the Protestants split. We get then very many. I mean, there are hundreds of sects of, of the Protestants, and you can trace these. There's a lot of good uh, history of, uh, of religion, how and why these splits occurred, and uh, to, to what extent, and then how they identify themselves uh, from others. And we see that's all around us uh, today. Yeah, there, this, this guy, Fabio Sani, one of the things he works on is religious schisms. So definitely so. Of course, these religions now cross many societies, and they become uh, this element 
even the Romans had allowed for many religions. So it seems like uh, religions could be a much more fluid thing within societies than leadership and overall identity for the society. So the question is the balance between these things and how they matter. I'm not sure, uh, you know, what one thing that really interests me, and I couldn't get a clear answer on this from anyone, and I haven't pestered everybody yet, but I yeah, will do that later, uh, is uh, hunter-gatherers didn't have leaders until they started to settle down. They would have people with more influence, but they would also have uh, some healer person that was influential as well, and was usually, you know, ended up being two people. And I'm actually wondering if, re you know, religion and leadership were ever once the same thing, or if they started off as different things. Because it is now true that they're generally different things. But it seems to be two forms of influence that happen in a lot of societies. We could talk at dinner. Yeah. Um, I thought we were gonna have a play question, because that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked a lot about, about um, identity and the importance for society. So by that rationale, would you say that individuals that refuse to self-identify in the groups that they belong to, is that destructive for society? Uh, when you look at the, everything a society does, when you look at any parameter of behavior, some things are acceptable and some's not. So we allow for a lot of latitude in some things and much less in other things. And of course, in this con country, there are, you know, the flag is a really big deal, more than most countries. We go crazy over our flag. So not like not being nice to the flag is a terrible thing. And so that varies from country to country in an interesting, and that's an interesting way. So it all depends what you're looking at. And that, that particular equation in itself is really interesting. <laughs> how this very, what variability is allowed and how that changes over time. And the very categories we use. There's a great book, uh, Whites of a Different Color, you know, like Irish people were once considered non-white. So we develop all these categories that shift over time too. So these parameters and how we treat each other and what we consider important are constantly shifting. Um, hello. I was wondering if you had any um, comments with regard to the recent Nature paper about intraspecies murdering uh, in the mammal line and how that correlated with society, and you know, also with regard to you comparing like book clubs and football in that slide, is there a difference between societal groups that are competitive with each other and some that aren't? Well, I didn't read the, the, that paper, so I, you will have to ex tell me about it. But there is, is interesting because uh, hunter-gatherers were very non-competitive. I'm not convinced that's true of Australians, but I can't get enough information. On the, but there are papers on play in the hunter-gatherer, the, the San Bushman, and they don't have play where someone wins or loses. They don't have play where someone gets knocked down. All their play is pleasant. So, just saying. I'll make up an answer for the next one, the other question, without knowing and reading the paper. Um, I'm wondering if there is an interaction with um, development time, in the sense that humans, of course, have a much longer development period than certain other organisms. But I don't know enough about uh, how learning and development might interact to designate what is an appropriate range of markers to identify people. Uh, am I, is my question clear enough? Yeah, well, I guess it's clear enough. There's, uh, and there's some really cool stuff in the psychology literature. Most of it suggests things happen very early. So like five-year-old kids already know that burning flags are wrong. And then I talked about, you know, uh, races, ethnicities, and, and uh, as well languages and their capacity to even remember differences. You know, if, if your child is brought up by you and a monkey, it will learn monkey faces and be able to distinguish monkeys really well. So even human children can like branch out when they have that three month to six month interval, they see monkeys or box turtles or whatever it is, they get very good at those.